The pain pods presented by Trumeau Pharmaceuticals and is intended for educational and informational purposes only. Please speak to medical professionals before making any treatment decisions and visit TrumeauRx.com to learn more about their work. There's no such thing as real or unreal pain. Pain doesn't know gender or culture or anything, right? It afflicts us all. Because it affects so many people in often profound ways. You know, you do a lot of thinking when you're in pain. I think it gives you a certain perspective on life. Definitely did not want to accept it, and I also didn't believe that that was really the plan for my life. I always get through it, though. Always. Hi, this is Patrick, and welcome back to The Pain Pod. On this episode, we discuss how racial and gender biases play a role in preventing people from receiving appropriate pain care. We speak to health professionals as well as members of the sickle cell disease community since sickle cell predominantly affects black Americans and comes with more than its fair share of pain. Uh, What's up, y'all? I'm Nori Davis, and I'm from Yonkers, New York. And what I do is stand-up comedy, baby. Or it does me sometimes. Sometimes I really can't tell. But I am caught in this whirlwind of stand-up, known as comedy. My first album, Home Game, came out 2012. It's on, uh, I have a whole act about uh, sickle cell and playing ball and how my boys would think I was in pain because I had AIDS. And it's just like, no, it's not AIDS, it's sickle cell. And they didn't know what it was. And it was like, yeah, you got AIDS. Like they just, that ignorance. And I, I would joke about that and describe what what sickle cell pain would, was like. Like it, it felt like that game Fruit Ninja where the bananas are half your blood cells and and the, the oxygen just whip it away and then you have no more blood cells. That was, I think that was the best type of analogy at the time I could describe it. Hi, my name is Kim Smith-Whitley. I work at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia as a pediatric hematologist. And I am the director of the Comprehensive Sickle Cell Center where we follow almost a thousand children and young adults living with sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease is Unfortunately, a disease that's characterized by unpredictable onset of acute pain. Sickle cell pain feels like it's one of those pains you do wish on your your worst enemy so they can leave you alone. (laughs) It's like that. The sharp, excruciating pain, feeling like something wanted to rip out of me. The sharp, sharp, sharp pain. And I just remembering how to manage it is breathing, just how women breathe when they're pregnant. You know, you take a breath, breath, you hold it, and you breathe, breathe, and you hold your breath, let it pass, and then you breathe. So it's like you take it in waves. That's how I learned from a young age at like six. I think that the health disparities and the stigmatization is so embedded in the care of individuals with sickle cell disease. The number of individuals that have been labeled as opioid seeking, who have been labeled as difficult. Hi, my name is Tariq Powell from Detroit, Michigan. I'm going to school to be a nurse. And I have sickle cell. So what we have tried to do because of stigmatization and because we know that there are differences in the way that providers approach different individuals with pain that may be disease specific or race culturally biased, we really have had to teach individuals with sickle cell disease to self-advocate. Well, first it started off like as a cold because I had got sick. I get like my immune system kind of like it's low. So when I got sick, they, I, I went to the doctors and they were like, they didn't know how to treat me. So I went so I went to the school doctor and then she referred me to uh, the doctor of the whole state. Okay, so then you come to the emergency department and you know the last time you were in, you got X milligrams of Y drug and that worked really well for you. Um, and then when they tried to change the frequency that didn't work so well, He was like kind of rude, cause he 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 wanted me not to he wanted me not to like see no more doctors, not to not to go to the hospital. I tell him, but it was one day my pain was just so bad in my legs, it was like hard for me to walk, like and I got migraines. So 
it was just hard for me to do a lot of schoolwork and I couldn't focus. So I went to the hospital. He, he ended up kicking me out because he said my blood work was too good and I shouldn't be there. So imagine a young male coming to the hospital and asking for five milligrams of IV dilaudid because that's what worked for him before. And what the provider must be thinking who is taking care of that young person. I was bad. I was beyond mad. I actually, actually I got kicked out the little office because I was so mad. And I, and I just ended up like spiraling out of control in the missing three weeks of school and came back home. I had to go to the hospital for two weeks. And it's unfortunate because you hear from adults living with sickle cell disease that coming to the emergency department is the last resort. And that they dress up before they come to the emergency department. They make sure that they are well-spoken, that they are calm, that they are measured and that they look appropriate so that they are not put into a category and then further stigmatized based on economics or other cultural biases. It's like I be seeing like people in the hospital who has no pain who just there and like they get treated a lot of times before me and I've been sitting there longer. And I'm like, uh, I can see I was in pain a whole I was there for like two hours and nobody would ever treat me. They would walk past me, like all this. I'm like, I'm, and I, I keep going up there like, I'm in pain, bad, like real bad pain. And it's like, nobody will come help me until, I, until I'm about to just leave. It's unbelievable how stereotypes and bias impact the care that people receive in this country. Hi, my name is Christy Van Horn. I am from Poughkeepsie, New York, and I am a public health consultant. We know that when it comes to pain management for Black people, that they are 34% less likely to be prescribed pain meds than white people. They have been shown to receive lower doses, they wait longer for pain meds, and they also have their needs taken less seriously. A huge part of this problem is that they're seen as, you know, this, this stereotype that they're drug seekers. And we have to overcome that. Fortunately, in culture, in our culture right now, we're beginning to understand a little bit more how those things affect people, especially like uh, implicit bias when it comes to race. Psychotherapist Dr. Daniel Lyman and what people deal with every single day of having people treat them a certain way. And that can be really damaging to your self-esteem, to your ego, to your sense of well-being. So a client of mine who I worked with for a long time, and of course I don't say any names or anything because it's confidential, but she was half black, half white, and she never really thought of herself as black because she grew up around all white people. Um, and then when she moved to a certain area where it was a little bit, unfortunately, more racist, like people kept call, like started calling her all kinds of terrible names and treating her a certain way. And she found very quickly that she got really depressed because she didn't really realize that she was different until that point. She didn't really think about herself as that different. And then very quickly started to feel pretty bad about herself. And again, around that same time, not coincidentally, she started to develop pain. Then you talk about stigmatization and move to health disparities. And then that's a whole different conversation because then we have to talk about economics. We have to talk about comorbidities. We have to talk about what I believe is the right approach to a patient and not and to a young person living with sickle cell disease. And that's not just dealing with the medical issues, but dealing with the psychosocial and providing social services just as much as I provide medical services. And so really trying to put this all together comprehensively, I just don't think that you can have a conversation about sickle cell disease unless you're willing to address stigmatization and health disparities openly. I'm a privileged white woman. I'm sharing from the point of view of a researcher and public health professional that wants to use my voice to bring awareness. These are not my lived experiences. With that said, we know that institutional racism keeps Black people specifically sick. We are seeing this through COVID. It is a perfect example, unfortunately. 
We know that racism impacts access to care, that black folks specifically are very likely to experience discrimination at some point, if not regularly throughout their lives within the medical system. Popularity, resources, and politics. That's where the race is definitely a discrepancy you get right there of not being recognized, not getting the funding or the education to the doctors to help sickle cell patients equally as other sick patients with other diseases. I think with a medical disease, when I'm learning, people care about other people who they care about and want, don't want to see hurting. But it's when it's a stranger or a whole other race, it's really hard and difficult for them to have that empathy. So this is something that we have been dealing with in the sickle cell community for a long time. There are a lot of things that have been done to try to address this, some uh, direct provider learning modules with simulations of how to talk to patients and things that hopefully we think will make a difference. There are advocacy groups that have developed in our community that have taken this topic on full storm and they're wonderful at doing uh, webinars and seminars so that we can have an open conversation about how to approach these things. And I also want to be very clear that this is not all in their heads. That we often place this blame game, quote unquote, for race in America. It's their fault. They're not going to the doctor. But there's reasons for that. Many people, black people, immigrants, there's many reasons that they don't trust the medical system. There's such a dark history of experimentation without consent. We can talk about uh, the Tuskegee study, the infamous and unethical clinical study that was conducted for 40 years, from 1932 to 1972, where our government used black people to study syphilis without informed consent. They lied about the risks, they lied about the reasons that they were coming in for quote unquote treatment, because it wasn't treatment. Also, at the same time, they had a treatment for syphilis. There was penicillin available. It really helps to give us context as to why Black folks don't trust our medical system. And that's not their fault. And I think that I come across many different biases. I think that there are expectations culturally that I see that as, as particularly with approaches to pain and some of them uh, shift according to gender by culture. Some cultures expect the uh, woman to be stronger, the female to be stronger, others expect the male to be stronger. Some of them do not tolerate any degree of emotion or any kind of reassurance or comforting at at that level that we would expect. And so it, it moves, it's a moving piece. Yes, I see, I definitely see gender bias from the aspect of the approach to pain. And I see that change across the lifespan. We'll talk more about the role of gender in the healthcare system right after this quick word from our sponsor. The Pain Pod is produced by Bloodstream Media and made possible thanks to our sponsor, Tremo Pharmaceuticals. Tremo was founded with the goal of developing and delivering non-opioid pain therapies for people with rare diseases and other select patient conditions. Tremo is currently investigating two COX-2 selective NSAIDs. NSAID, for those who aren't familiar, stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. While neither of these treatments are FDA approved, they are in clinical trials and you can learn more about those trials, Tremo's mission, and the dedicated team leading it by going to tremorx.com. That's T-R-E-M-E-A-U-R-X.com. Tremo, leading the way for those left behind in pain. So 
I don't know how much time we have to address gender bias in the medical system, but I could talk about this all day. I also want to really highlight that this is such an important topic this week. It's actually Women's Health Week. So this is a very timely conversation to be bringing this topic to light. Women are less likely to be adequately treated for pain. They wait longer to get pain medication. And they're also more likely to be just dismissed entirely. And the doctors will blame it on a mental health disorder. Or if this is a key piece of it, they just simply don't believe that something's wrong. You go to the doctor, you feel ignored or dismissed because you are a woman or you identify as a woman. So you walk in, your symptoms are not taken seriously, you go misdiagnosed because your doctor won't listen to you. And not to mention, if you're not being believed, you're going to multiple doctors, you're trying to get a diagnosis, and you're also living with pain. Just as a whole, women pursue healthcare significantly more at a higher percentage than men. Chiropractor Dr. Ben Ozan. It has less to do with like, oh, you know, man versus woman, but more like women just care about things more or will be more proactive. So my, my patient base is significantly more female than male. Women are the healthcare decision makers the majority of the time in their household. Uh, and they're usually the ones that will pursue getting healthy and well over a man. So if anything, men were just stubborn and hard-headed and need to go pursue getting help a lot sooner than we do. And then part of the reason, this is the other side of the coin, that doctors don't trust us is because they actually don't know as much about us. Across every procedure, test, diagnosis, treatment, we are less research in just in general. We know that women make up a up to 70% of chronic pain patients, yet only 20% of pain medication has been tested on women. That's a huge gap in care. And then outside of that, you know, there are definitely some cultures um, that I've seen where the, the pervasive thought process and belief system prevents people from pursuing health. But at least in my profession, I wouldn't say that there is a purposeful discrimination or lack of care due to race or sex. I feel like at least when it comes to us and how we take care of people, the difference is who decides to actually pursue our care is different based off of you know cultures and then also just mindset and how people take care of their health in general. In the 1970s, medical ethicists began to address the risks of medical research. And at this time, women were excluded from medical research, quote unquote, for their own good, or for the good of their hypothetical fetus. And of course, our menstrual cycles could complicate the results. So in 1977, the FDA actually prohibited women of childbearing potential, quote unquote, implying that women couldn't be trusted to prevent pregnancies, they couldn't know their own risk of unintended pregnancy or make educated decisions about a trial if they became pregnant. But I do think that unfortunately, race and sex, sometimes people are discriminated against when it comes to getting adequate care because of the color of their skin or because they're a woman versus a man which I think should never be. We're, we're all God's children, we're all created equal, and we all deserve equal opportunities to get healthy and well. And if people are discriminating against someone because of the race that they, they come from or the gender that they're a part of, shame on them. So this is also part of the problem. We don't trust women to make these decisions for themselves. And much of this comes back to representation. So the top decision makers in medicine and, and research are white men. We fund what impacts us. So if white men are at the top of making all, you know, and they're the ones making all of these research decisions, they want to know more about prostate cancer than they do breast cancer. And that's just a very simple example.
did chronic pain play a role in getting into comedy? No, not really. I really tried to make sure the chronic pain was something that was, um, what can I describe it? It was, I don't know, maybe a bad dream once in a while, but it's definitely not nothing that's going to make me stop what I wanted to do. It's a big pain because a lot of stuff I couldn't tell, I was told not to do. And I like, I still do it, but just because I, I feel like I'm, the pain, on, it shouldn't stop my life. I should be able to do whatever I want to do. I think that you really have to understand that there are pieces of treatment that require a really um, sound therapeutic relationship between the provider and the patient going through the pain episode. Because in order to get to that mind-body experience, you really have to trust the person that's taking care of you in order to make sure that all of those elements are addressed. I had pain the last couple of months. That's unbearable to me. It's been the worst pain ever. Like pain, like sometimes it just get like bad. I don't know. I can't explain that pain. I can't explain that. I look for compassion in the people that I work with and I try to make sure that they feel free to use that whenever they want to provide excellent care. Nurses run the hospital. They always sit by your side. They make you feel better. They make you they make you feel they the ones that make you feel better. They, they don't want to give you the right amount of medicine. They don't, they're the one we call when we're in pain. And they always, they always seem to make me feel better. I can talk to them about stuff I got going on and they'll listen. It make me feel welcome. They don't ever like, like blow me off or just like be rude to me. I try to understand exactly what I need to do for the patient at that time for their pain at all different levels, pharmacologic, non-pharmacologic, supportive and comforting techniques, and then helping that person be able to make it to the next episode. Every nurse I had before was so open and talking to me. Like they're making me, they're the one who's making me want to become a nurse. That's what I'm going to school for. It's just every nurse I ever met was like the nicest people they tell me their nursing stories, all that stuff, so I can feel comfortable in there because they know I want to be a nurse. Every nurse and children basically know I want to be a nurse because I ask them a million and one questions so I can get my mind off the pain and stuff. So getting into comedy was watching a comedian named Ben Bailey who came to my college at Pratt Institute and watching him kill it. And I always loved laughing and everything. So I saw him kill it and I went to the comic strip live and uh, they had a class there with D.F. Sweetler, and I took that class, and he, he told me how to write a joke and stop saying, and stop saying that metaphors and, and cursing. <laughs> and uh, from there, I just knew this is what I wanted to do. A lot of uh, pressure that came on me with the pain was like going on the road a lot. And my mother, my mother would put that concern in my head a lot, but I never cared. I just, I don't want that to stop me. I never wanted it to stop me. Gender racial and cultural biases exist in our healthcare system, and they prevent people from receiving the care they need. Thanks to doctors like Kim Smith-Whitley and public health experts like Christy Van Horn, slowly but surely we're educating people and creating a more equitable system for all. Slowly but surely. Next week on our final episode of season one, we focus on a specific population of pain patients who we actually haven't spoken about much quite yet, Kids, how do we help children understand, talk about, and manage their pain? How do we help parents and adults understand their children's pain? We dive in next week on episode six, our season one finale of The Pain Pod. The Pain Pod is written and directed by me, Patrick James Lynch, produced and edited by Greg Holdsman, artwork by Ryan Geelan and Christina Newhard, post-production support from Joshua Sterling Bragg, Rob Bradford, and Avra Friedman, and this episode was hosted by me, Patrick James Lynch. 
The Pain Pod is produced by Bloodstream Media and presented by Tremo Pharmaceuticals. Learn more about Tremo and the work they're doing to help alleviate pain by visiting T-R-E-M-E-A-U-R-X.com. Subscribe, rate, and share the Pain Podcast. Referrals from you are the best way we can reach new people. Thanks for listening. My name is Patrick James Lynch, and we'll be back next week with Episode 6 of The Pain Pod.